a chilling whodunit, almost too sinister to comprehend. It started out with a seemingly ordinary family, suffering two devastating blows. The father and adult son suddenly dead, supposedly of natural causes. But it wasn't until their daughter ended up near death in the emergency room that the pieces started falling into place. ABC's Deborah Roberts has our story. I'm horrible. I'm a horrible mother. With 24-year-old Sarah Stoudy clinging to life in a Missouri hospital, instead of being by her side, her mom, Diane, is in interview room number three at the Springfield Police Station. My husband died last year of a heart attack. Answering questions about the recent deaths of her husband, Mark, and son, Sean. Do you have a son as well? No, not anymore. Not died. Both were found dead within months of each other. And now, with Sarah on the verge of death, investigators are wondering whether this church-going organist is the victim of unimaginable tragedy or a cold-blooded killer. I've screwed up everybody. I've screwed up my whole family. It all began here in the heart of the Bible Belt, where Diane and Mark are raising four kids in a small house. Tight quarters for what looks like a tight family. Diane is a nurse and church organist down at Redeemer Lutheran. She's also the family breadwinner. Mark, the lead singer and guitarist of a local blues band. Did you get any sense of what their relationship was like? As far as I knew, Mark's life was great. Charles Alexander is Mark's close buddy and the drummer in the band. He loved him. He loved his family. And it was just a great family. It's a shock to both friends and family when he dies suddenly in his sleep. I was devastated. I was devastated. Did you have any inkling that anything was wrong? No. The medical examiner rules the death due to natural causes. Diane moves her four children into a new house. Then months later, that coroner is back at her house again, this time for son, Sean. I said, we just saw the coroner's van was here. Are you OK? Is everything all right? And she said, oh, yeah, my son died. Her neighbor says she's surprised by Diane's response when offering condolences. Was she distraught? No, she said it to me just like that. She said, my son died. Very matter-of-factly. I just was shocked. Now only the stouty women are left. Diane, daughters Rachel, Sarah, and 12-year-old Brianna. I think they closed the doors even tighter because you didn't see them outside. I don't know how they even got their mail because we didn't see them at the mailbox. It's just the following June when tragedy seems to strike again. Diane rushes 24-year-old daughter Sarah to the ER. 911, where is your emergency? But this time, someone claiming to be close to the family calls in a tip to police, hinting that the pious church organist may harbor an unholy family secret. What did the caller say exactly? That Diane Stoudy might be responsible for two or three homicides. Again, brought up Mark's death, Sean's death being very uh, close proximity to each other. Also spoke about the potential that Sarah was going to die as well. The detective assigned to investigate, Neil McAmos, visits the hospital where he gets troubling news from Sarah's doctor. He said that he was uh, suspicious that there was, it was a possible poisoning case. So your radar goes up? Definitely. McAmos figures it's about time for Diane Stoudy to answer questions. She voluntarily comes to the station. Don't um, know what I can tell you. With cameras rolling, McAmos asks about her life and marriage quickly revealing a reservoir of resentment. We were still married, but it was not what you call a good marriage. I wasn't happy. <laughs> McCamus now shifts from questioner to sympathizer. I'm a believer myself, so I understand where you're coming from on that. And elicits a bombshell confession. Put it really short and sweet. I knew they were drinking antifreeze. And the chilling details pour out. Diane Stoudy wow. describing how she slipped antifreeze into her family's drinks. How much would you put in? A couple of teaspoons, maybe. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. There were times I didn't know what to say or, or how to react. Apparently, she'd had it with her husband, saying she considered him an abusive deadbeat. Because by then, I hated his guts. He would throw things at me. He would throw things at the kids. And her children, Sean and Sarah, both burdens in her eyes, not living up to mom's expectations. Both Sean and Sarah would just 
basically, I don't know, trashed the house and never helped support or even contribute. Sean would be interfering with whatever I would do. So if he was just a constant bother, wouldn't leave you alone? No, oh, he was more than a bother. Would a pest, would that be a good word for it? No, it was more than that. I'm not a perpetual killer. I'm just stupid. I regret doing it. I really do. But it's too late. Diane's arrested. Case closed? Not by a long shot. With Sarah still clinging to life across town, police are busy combing through the Stouty home, the antifreeze in plain sight. They also find an unassuming purple diary that belongs to Diane's other daughter, Rachel. It appeared to be in a journal entry written by Rachel, knowing that uh, Mark and Sean were getting ready to be killed. That journal entry dated June 13, 2011, nearly a year before Mark Stoudy died. It reads, It's sad when I realize how my father will pass on in the next two months. Sean, my brother, will move on shortly after. It will be tough getting used to the changes, but everything will work out. So at first, you're thinking this is a, a mother, an evil mother, who's tried to wipe out her family. And now you discover her daughter might be involved helping her? Yes. <laughs> Confronted with her diary, Rachel, always her mom's favorite, reveals the awful truth that she was also mother's little helper. When did you guys come up with this plan? I mean, we talked about it, like... Christmas. In another interrogation, Rachel tells police that she and mom Diane weren't exactly finished. The next target, the youngest daughter, 12-year-old Brianna. When were you guys going to kill Brianna? Sometime after Sarah. The Springfield poisoning case. Two people dead, two in jail, one in the hospital. The tale hits the news like an F3 twister. A mother and daughter both arraigned for murder. The Springfield community is in shock. And when I heard that he was poison, then I just cried, I collapsed. I said, I can't believe this woman did this. But no one's more surprised than this young woman. I assumed that it wasn't true. They were innocent people being blamed. This is Sarah Stoudy sharing her story for the first time, defying all the odds, surviving a vicious poisoning and living to tell the tale. Do you still consider them family? Not anymore. I consider them as killers who hate me. She had to relearn to walk and talk. I'm right here. Her speech still stunted from the irreversible brain damage she suffered. They really planned this heinous crime. I was shocked. I just felt like I wanted to strangle my mom because of what she did. Did the police blow this thing? Could they have prevented Sarah's poisoning by connecting these dots? I think it's easy to go back now, and there was nothing at that point to indicate anything malicious. Neither one of them knew about the, the other deaths. As for the medical examiner, who critics say bungled the bodies of Mark and Sean, missing obvious signs of foul play, they defend their work on the case. And yet for all the pain and loss, Sarah says she harbors no ill will against her mother, who in the end pleads guilty. Sarah was even brave enough to face her mom in court on the day she was sentenced to life in prison without parole. I forgive my mom. What changed? As time went by, I matured. Her sister Rachel pled guilty to lesser charges and will be eligible for parole when she turns 65. Sarah smiles fondly when sharing photographs of a life that seems like a distant memory. That little boy here is my brother, Sean. Deborah Roberts for Nightline in Springfield, Missouri.